Well, welcome once again to Baltimore Orioles baseball. It is here, and here come the Indians leading off with Kenny Lofton in center field, Glenn Allen Hill, the designated hitter, Carlos Baeger, the second baseman, Albert Bell, the left fielder, Paul Sorrento, the first baseman, Mark Whitten in right field, Sandy Alomar catching, Brooke Jacoby at third base, Mark Lewis at shortstop. Out on the mound for the Orioles is a big guy right, uh, Rick Sutcliffe, all ready to go. We're kind of in a big hurry here, and I'm in a happy hurry to turn things over to a fellow I'm very happy is back in Baltimore once again. Joe Angel. All right, Chuck. Thank you very much. He doesn't get a whole lot better than this. As Sunclave is all set to go to work, Kenny Lofton for the Indians steps in, and he takes a high inside fastball. One and all, oh, and uh, the 1992 season is now officially underway. Sutcliffe with a 1-0 delivery. Lofton takes a strike on the inside corner. Even up at 1-1. Rick Sutcliffe, this his eighth opening day assignment. He has a record... Uh, as he goes into his motion again and delivers one and one, Lofton swings and he sends a fly ball down the left field line. Brady has to make a long run. The ball dropping in a hurry, but it lands on the warning track in foul territory. Anderson could not get to it. Cal couldn't get to it. And on one bounce, it winds up in the lower deck. So the count to Kenny Lofton is now one ball and two strikes. For five consecutive years, Sutcliffe was the opening day starter for the Chicago Cubs. His last one was in April of 1989. In opening day games, Sutcliffe has a record of four and two with one no decision. Then he misses high and inside. Even up a two and two to Kenny Lofton, a good looking young player. One of uh, many that the Indians have for 1992. Here's a 2 2 delivery. Lofton takes a little bit low and inside. Boy, Sutcliffe thought he had him. Hoyles thought he had him. But Lofton stays alive. Three balls and two strikes. Kenny Lofton, at one time a starting guard for the University of Arizona basketball team. Fly ball. Out to shallow right field. Orsalak is drifting in, looking up into the bright blue sky, and he makes the catch. And now Sutcliffe will go to work on Glenn Allen Hill. He is the Indians' designated hitter in this game. Switch hitting Carlos Baerga, the second baseman, is due up next. Then it'll be Albert Bell, Paul Sorrento, Mark Witten, Sandy Alomar, Brooke Jacoby, and Mark Lewis. All the way through number nine. One away, base is empty. Here's Glenn Allen Hill, a right-handed batter. Pitch on the way to him is a rising fastball. One ball and no strikes. The Orioles defensively with Leo Gomez a little bit behind the bag at third. Cal at short with Billy at second and Glenn Davis in back of the bag at first. Hoyle's doing the catching with Brady Anderson in left. Mike Devereaux in center field and Orsalag in right. Now the 1-0 delivery again very high and inside and the count 2-0 to Glenn Allen Hill. Right-hander against right-hander. Sutcliffe, who had a good spring, as many of the Orioles did. Here's the 2-0 delivery, and Hill takes a knee-high strike. It looked like a sinking fastball. Sutcliffe has the hard sinking fastball, and he has pretty much of a straight fastball. He throws a curve at a couple of different speeds, and he also throws a slider, straight changeup. Swung on, he popped him up. Shallow right center field. Devereaux loping in. He's there. And he makes the catch. Joe, we've got, as you have mentioned, uh, I think what the players refer to as a high sky. There isn't a cloud in sight this afternoon. Make very difficult to track the ball. The infielders are always turning and looking at the outfielder and by gesture trying to help him steer and align himself on the pop-up. And it's not an easy thing. It is. I don't think we're going to see any kind of a routine fly ball today under the brilliant sunshine and a cloudless sky. Indeed. If you had to uh, order the weather for opening day, <laughs> this would be it right here. Room service. Two outs, bases empty. Here's Carlos Baerga, switch hitting second baseman with a very wide open stance. Sutcliffe will deliver to him and uh, again gets behind uh, with a high fastball. One and oh. Baerga, last year a 288 batting average with 11 home runs and 69 RBIs. For the Indians, he played second base. Uh, he played some third base as well. There's a 1-0 delivery. Baerga swings, and he sends a fly ball to shallow right field. Orsalank is coming in toward the infield. He's there on the side. 
is retired. Three pop flies. And the Indians go one, two, three, go to the bottom of the inning. It is the Indians nothing, and here come the Orioles. Leading off for the Orioles, Brady Anderson in left field. Batting number two, Joe Orsalak, the right fielder. Cal Ripken at shortstop. Glenn Davis, batting number four at first base. Mike Devereaux, the center fielder. Sam Horn, the designated hitter this afternoon. Leo Gomez at third base. Chris Hoyles is the catcher, and Bill Ripken is the second baseman and the Orioles with their first at bat in the history of this magnificent ballpark and for that let's go right back to Joe and a big moment for Brady Anderson Brady will lead off after having a fine spring Charles Nagy right hander delivers a swing a little tapper up that first baseline coming into field in foul territory is Paul Sorrento whom the Indians acquired from the Minnesota ball club just about a week ago played only five games in spring training, uh, did a good job with the bat. He won the job. And because Reggie Jefferson for the Indians started uh, the season on the disabled list, well, Sorrento will play some first base. They got nothing and one to Brady Anderson. Brady at 267 in spring training. Stole nine out of ten bases in the springtime. Hit one home run. Very aggressive. Great job defensively. And he has won the left field job and the leadoff job for the Orioles at least initially he'll play every day Charles Nagy right hander he was a rookie last year actually came up in 1990 as he delivers to Brady he takes a pitch in the dirt so he's even up at one and one he made his debut with the Indians in 1990 he threw about 45 innings and so technically last year Nagy was still a rookie because you are required to throw 50 innings to lose that rookie status Here's the 1-1 one, one delivery. Anderson takes a little bit low on the count. Two and one. Last year, Nagy made 33 starts. Went over 211 innings. Gave up 228 hits, including 15 home runs. There's a ground ball hit to the second baseman by Edgar. Ranging to his right, and he throws out Anderson. Brady hit the ball sharply, but could not get it through the infield. So Anderson is retired 4-3. And now here's Orsola. Probably, probably see a few ground balls. Uh, my information, they tell me this fellow basically is a sinker ball pitcher. He throws a real hard sinker, likes to keep the ball down. And now he'll go to work on Orsola. Joe hit 235 in spring training with one home run, and he takes off speed and again down low. One and oh. Nagy, we mentioned his record last year 10 and 15 as a rookie. Here's the 1 0 delivery. Orsalak takes a strike, another off speed pitch. So it is even up at 1 and 1. Nagy losing 15 games on a ball club that lost 105 for the year. Another breaking ball, this one almost in the dirt, down and in. Count to Orsalak is 2 and 1. The Indians, one of the worst clubs a year ago in recent memory, and the worst since the 88 Orioles. There's a chopper, a foul ball off to the right. Count to Orsalak is now even up at two and two. Last year, Nagy led all rookies in the major leagues in starts, in complete games, innings pitched, and in losses. So he had a full season. Ten of his losses, by the way, came on the road. That led the league. There's a ground ball, a one hopper, cradled by Sorrento. He will run to the bag. And get the out. Nicely done by Paul Sorrento. And uh, just like that, there were two outs. And here comes Cal. Well, the defending American League MVP is about to make his 1992 debut after a sensational spring. Where he wound up with a batting average of 366 with a couple of home runs and 17 RBIs. It'll be right hander against right hander. Nagy delivers. Cal takes low. 1 and 0. Oh. Cal was only 1 for 8 against Nagy last year, but that one hit was a home run. Here comes the pitch. A slow, tantalizing breaking ball that dropped in there for beauty. A call strike and the count even up at 1 and 1. Nagy. Very inconsistent last year. 
Stocky right-hander delivers, and Cal a half swing at another good breaking ball. And he changed up there. Cal just could not contain himself. He walks outside the batter's box, giving himself a lecture. Now steps out again, just kind of thinking things over, and slowly digs in again. One ball and two strikes. Nagy ready and delivers. Cal swings and he grounds it foul outside the bag at third. It remains at one ball and two strikes. Nagy, if you look at his numbers, his first five starts last year, he had a 167 ERA. His next five starts, his ERA was over eight runs a game. And his next five, a 185 ERA. So he's really up and down. Cal takes a little bit low. Even up at two and two. Didn't miss by much there. No score. Bottom of inning number one. At Oriole Park at Camden Yards. His 1992 is underway. Here comes the 2-2 delivery. There's a swing and a fly ball to Albert Bell. In shallow left field. Racing in toward the infield. He had to run. Makes a lunging one-handed basket catch of the ball. Bell misjudging it. The wind apparently blowing in from left field. And Bell had to hustle in toward the infield to make a running one-handed basket catch of the ball. And the Orioles go one, two, three. At the end of one, no score. Well, it's a brand-new ball game. All new higher energy efficiency standards uh, for home heating and cooling equipment have been set by government. Your professional York dealer has the equipment to save you money on fuel and energy and backed up by some of the best warranties in the industry. Call Charlie Klein and Sons in Baltimore at 549-6960. They will tell you how to qualify for factory preseason rebates and utility rebates with a York high efficiency system. Call Charles Klein and Sons at 549-6960. Glenn Davis just picked one right out of a spectator's purse down the first baseline. That might be the defensive play so far of the ball game. He actually did. Came right into the box seat railing and leaned in and made a nifty kind of a catch. Nicely done by Glenn Davis on a ball hit by Albert Bell leading off of the Indians here in the top of inning number two. Roy Davis on the replay stayed right with it. Called, caught the ball on the heel of his mitt and somehow held it. Now here is Paul Sorrento, the newly acquired Paul Sorrento, and he takes high and outside. Ball one. Sorrento with the Twins a year ago in a total of 26 games. Picked up a few days ago. As Sutcliffe will work on him again. There's a line drive left center field. Devereaux on the run. The ball gets by him. It's off his mitt. Brady backing up on the play. He juggles it. Here's Sorrento heading into second base and he slides in safely. Mike Devereaux couldn't get to it. Brady was right there to back him up but he allowed the ball to get by him. Just a few feet by the time he came up with it. Sorrento who had hesitated as he rounded first base, then took off and made it to second base easily. Joe, I think they scored a single and error left field, allowing him to take second base. And I think the reason for that is because Sorrento, as we mentioned, did hesitate. He had stopped. Then he saw Brady juggle the ball. Then he took off for second base. So it'll be a single and an error. Now, Sutcliffe will pitch to... Mark Witten, a switch hitter, and he takes a call strike. Nothing in one. We'll give you a station break in a second here. Mark Witten, the Indians right fielder and a former member of the Toronto Blue Jays. Last year with a batting average of 256, seven home runs and 26 RBIs. In limited duty. Here's a pitch. He takes outside the ball. And so the count to Witten is two balls and no strikes. Sutcliffe, who becomes uh, very deliberate with men on base. Here's a 1 1 offering, and uh, this one down and in to Witten. They got 2 and 1. Jeff Newman coaching at third base for the Indians, and Dave Nelson over in the first base coaching box. Mike Devereaux shading Witten a little bit toward right center, giving him a gap in left center field. Brady about medium depth and left. Here's a 2-1 pitch. Swing on a miss. He got him on a changeup. So it's even up at 2-2. Two and two. Nicely done by Sutcliffe. Sutcliffe 
we mentioned uh, this is eighth opening day assignment. Five of them with the Chicago Cubs. There's a 2 2 pitch. This one in the dirt. Hoyles came up with it. The count three and two. For the Indians, a couple of years, back in 83 and 84, he won. He won for the Cubs in 85. Then he lost his next two for the Cubs, 86 and 87. He had a no decision for the Cubs in 88. And last year for the Cubs, he won. He beat the Phillies on opening day, 5 to 4. So his overall record, 4 and 2 on opening day. Here's a pitch. Swing and a pop up foul off third. Gomez and Hoyles are chasing, but it's well back out of play. We'll pause for station identification. This is the Orioles Radio Network. Now we're back at Oriole Park in the top of inning number two. The Orioles nothing and the Indians nothing, but the Indians have a runner in scoring position for Mark Witten. Sutcliffe with a count of three and two. First base is open, and Sandy Alomar waits on deck. Here's the pitch. He swings and misses, and he chased ball four. Sutcliffe came in with a fastball that was high and inside, and Witten could not lay off. The catcher, number 15, Sandy so he does Sutcliffe a major favor. And with two outs, here is Sandy Alomar, the fine young Indians catcher. Sutcliffe getting his first strikeout. Alomar, of course, uh, injured most of last season, wound up missing 111 games a year ago. Sutcliffe takes a look at second. He comes home and picks up a call strike. Nothing in one. The third baseman, the veteran Brooke Jacoby, will follow. He would be next. The Orioles defensively giving Alomar a big gap in left center. Devereaux very shallow in center field and over toward right center. High fastball from Sutcliffe. Count even up at one and one. Gomez backed up way behind third base. Sandy Alomar. A right-handed batter. Where's number 15? Looks like he's healthy and... uh, all set to contribute for the Indians. As Sutcliffe okays the sign. And here it comes. Alomar takes a curve that stayed inside. Two and one to Sandy Alomar. Well, the weather could not be any better. Sunshine. About 62 degrees or so. Not a cloud in the sky. Fast ball. He missed high and outside. Ball three. Three and one. Tomorrow the Orioles have a day off. And then on Wednesday night, the first night game here in this ballpark. Sutcliffe trying to get the Orioles off to a good start. He had a pretty good spring, as most of the Orioles starters did. Now the veteran right-hander will back off the rubber. Talking to Johnny Oates before the game, he says initially in the season, he's going to give Sutcliffe a lot of leeway. Even if he does give up a couple of hits or a couple of runs, he's going to stay with him as much as he can. You know, the veteran, there's a fly ball to Devereaux. He was shallow. He's racing back to center field. He may not get there. He reaches over the shoulder and makes a phenomenal run in one-handed catch. He made the catch out of Willie May. It looked like he would never get there. But somehow he did. Onto the warning track in center field. Mike Devereaux makes a phenomenal catch of the ball. Already one to remember, Chuck. <laughs> well, that's, I think if you talk to Sutcliffe, he'd say that's a classic example of running down the pitcher's mistake. What a wonderful defensive play. Now they're showing a replay on uh, Jumbotron here at the ballpark, and uh, the play gets another ovation. And so thanks to Mike Devereaux at the end of one and a half, no score. Right now the Orioles in the bottom of number two after a phenomenal play by Mike Devereaux in the top of the inning, saving Sutcliffe and the Orioles at least one run. Devereaux, we had just mentioned, was playing very shallow and over toward right center field. It looked as though he had a tough time picking the ball up initially. Here's Glenn Davis. 
He takes low and outside, ball one. Then realizing it, finally picked it up, started racing toward the warning track. And on a dead run, a la Willie Mays made an over the left shoulder catch of the ball, racing onto the warning track and just shy of the wall. Here's a breaking ball that bounces into Alomar. Well, the count two and O oh to Glenn Davis. Already a memorable defensive play by Mike Devereaux in center field. Now here's the 2 nothing offering. There's a swing and he pulled it foul down the left field line. The ball heading for the corner. About 340 feet away, but it's a foul ball all the way. The count to Davis now 2 and 1. Of course, 333 feet down the left field line. Then 364 over toward left center. The deepest part of the ballpark is 410 just to the left of straightaway center. Here's the pitch. Davis swings and he grounds the ball. A base hit up the middle. And Glenn Davis has the first ever Oriole hit at Camden Yards. I wonder if they're going to give him the ball. I mean, historically, if you had the first hit in this ballpark, would you want to save it? I certainly would, Ali. But uh, I don't they may not do that. I guess they may not do it. Ground ball up the middle. A base hit to center field. Now here's Mike Devereaux. Normally, a guy who makes a great defensive play like that leads off the next inning, but that was not the case here. But you never notice it when it doesn't happen <laughs> until <right>. today. <laughs> Devereaux takes a strike on the inside corner. Nothing in one. I think you're right, Chuck. That ball should be put away somewhere. I would think, I really would think that Glenn would like to have it in his trophy <laughs> case. Uh, but uh, nobody seems to have thought about it. Breaking ball to Devereaux, low and inside a ball, and, uh, and you know it when is you, even up at one one. You know when you you think about Glenn Davis for a little bit, I think you uh, uh, realize that he wouldn't think about that. He's he's a very hard nosed, dedicated fellow. He's not concerned so much about his individual accomplishments as he is winning the ball game. So I would I'm reasonably sure the thought never occurred to him. I think you're right. Glenn wouldn't think, but somebody should think about it. Yeah. <laughs> Mike Devereaux. One and one. Here comes the pitch. A little chopper towards short. Could be two. On to second for one by Edgar's relay. Two. A double play. Six, four, three. Ball was not hit all that hard, but the Indians able to turn it. And just like that, two outs and the base is empty. And uh, we'll bring up the big guy in Sam Horn. Hall of Famer Jim Palmer and Bulova Watch Company suggest that you visit your nearby Mellar Jewelers and see their terrific selection of men's and ladies' Bulova Watches. Mellar Jewelers. And Bulova names you can trust. Now with two outs, here is Sam Horn. No score. Bottom of inning number two. Right-hander Charles Nagy will pitch to Sam Horn. Here comes and uh, Horn takes a little bit low. Ball one. Big Sam with one spring training home run. <coughs> After having been injured in the early going, there's a swing and a foul back to the backstop. Even up at one and one. And just to give you the remaining dimensions, 373 feet to right center. And of course, only 318 feet down the right field line. The wall, 25 feet high. There's a swing and a pop fly down the left field line. The ball drifting, heading for the left field corner. And it will be back about three rows deep. And out of play. One ball and two strikes is the count. The Indians with Jacoby at third, Lewis at shortstop, Baerga the second baseman, Sorrento at first, Alomar in back of the plate, Bell, Lofton, and Witten in the outfield. The Indians with a lot of young talent. They have a potential star at just about every position. Here's the one-two delivery. Sam swings and he lines it over shortstop. Base hit to left center field. Bell coming in to pick it up. And then gets it back into second base. Good job of hitting by Big Sam. Goes the other way. One thing he said. The wall in right field. The warehouse makes an awfully inviting target. But it would be foolish to try to hit it there. Just let those come. In the exhibition game against the Mets. Bobby Bonilla hitting left-handed. Hit one onto Utah Street. And hit the warehouse on a couple of hops. 
But to hit the warehouse on a fly, you have to hit it 460 feet. Gomez takes a breaking ball. Too low, ball one. Think he could get there with a seven iron? <laughs> Only if I aim it that way. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a pitch. Look out. Inside to Gomez. A count two and oh. Let's see. 460 feet divided by three is what? So it'd be 132 yards. For me, it'd be a driver. As a chopper hit toward the hole, to his right is the shortstop. On to Baerga at second base to get the lead man, and the Orioles are done. No runs, a couple of hits. They leave one. We played two in 1992, and no score. On the SK scoreboard at the end of eight, the Blue Jays with a 4 to nothing lead over Detroit. Back of Jack Morris, Dave Winfield had the year's first RBI with a base hit. Pat Borders had the year's first home run for the Blue Jays. Here we go to the third. It's a nothing-nothing game. And now with the play-by-play, let's get right to Chuck Thompson. An off-speed breaking, uh, an off-speed breaking pitch is called a strike as we go to the top of the third inning to the veteran Brooke Jacoby. Right-handed swinger, Sutcliffe, the Oriole right-hander, throws hard but misses outside. That makes the count one ball and one strike. Jacoby is, uh, they call him the granddaddy of the infield. He's 32, and he had a heck of a spring training for the Tribe. Hit something like 377. He awaits the 1-1 offering. Uh, the Oriole right-hander Sutkip throws. He's got it this time over the outer portion, right around the letters, and the strike is rung up by plate umpire Larry Barnett. The other members of the crew are Al Clark at first base, Dale Ford at second base, and Greg Koss is the umpire at third. No score. And the Indians have a hit on their side. The Orioles have two on their side. Breaking pitch is wide of the mark to even the count of two balls, two strikes to Jacoby. Jacoby resigned with the Indians in the offseason, and he's uh, in the starting day lineup for the ninth straight year that this solid veteran has been in the starting day lineup. Sutcliffe brings the arm down, swing and a miss. He got him on the breaking ball, and that for Rick Sutcliffe will be strikeout number two. He also got uh, Mark Whitten in the second inning on a swinging strike. One down, nobody on, no score. Top of the third inning. Orioles Park at Camden Yards in Baltimore is everything that you've read and everything that you've heard. It is absolutely spectacular. The Oriole infield against the right-handed swings of Mark Lewis. It's kind of straight up. The outfielder, uh, Devereaux, the center fielder, a bit toward right. Here's a breaking pitch in, and a strike is called to Mark Lewis. Devereaux kind of shallow and a little bit toward the alley in right center. Deep and straight away in right field is Joe Orsalak. Wide of the mark and uh, or the line out in left field toward left center, of course, Brady Anderson. Infield is straight up and the pitch is hit high and deep down the right field side. Fading foul and out of play down in the right field corner. And some fan down that way will have a cherished souvenir. The first game ever, major league game ever in this ballpark. And he takes home a souvenir baseball. Wouldn't we all like to be able to do that? One out, nobody on. Two-strike pitch to Lewis. Is Sutcliffe going to come after him, or will he just kind of waste the two-strike pitch? He throws high and out of the strike zone, and Lewis was cranked up, ready to go. As a matter of fact, stepped out over the plate in his effort to stop the swing. Right-handers uh, this afternoon for the visiting Indians. It's uh, Charlie and Nagy and the solid veteran Rick Sutcliffe for the Orioles. The big fellow throws the pitch, breaking pitch, low and outside, makes the count two balls, two strikes. Uh, when you talk about Sutcliffe, and I'm of a mind as a baseball fan, and particularly an Oriole fan, that this might be one of the most important acquisitions that Roland Heeman and the, the Orioles have been able to make for their 1992 season. Here comes uh, the Sutcliffe 2-2 pitch. Swing and a towering pop-up, middle of the infield on the first base side. Coming down the line, Glenn Davis. He's on the infield grass to the first base side of the mound and makes the catch for the second out of the inning. You can say a lot of things about Sutcliffe, but I think the paramount thing you can say in describing Rick Sutcliffe is he knows how to pitch. This man's not a thrower. He is a pitcher. He goes after the hitter's weaknesses. He is skillful. He is not a nibbler. He will go right after the hitter, and if he is healthy, he will be a very welcome addition to this Oriole team. Very, very shallow at third base now is uh, 
Gomez as the hitter standing in is center fielder Kenny Lofton and this fellow is one of the swiftest men in the majors and he gets a ball one too high. 1-0 to Lofton, two out, nobody on, no score. We are in the Cleveland half of the third inning. Well, the first final of the day is in and Toronto beats Detroit 4-2. to two. That on the SK scoreboard. They started their game a little after 1 o'clock. Well, Sutcliffe misses low and inside with a ball two. Lofton, a left-handed swinger, and he's got just outstanding speed. He might be one of the one of the swiftest men in all the majors. Although we don't get a chance to look at the National League, the pitch is high out of the strike zone, ball three. And now this is what Sutcliffe just does not want to do. You don't ever want to walk a fellow like Kenny Lofton. Because walking him is sometimes the equivalent of a two-base hit, the pitch. Strike is called, and Lofton was under wraps, took it all away. Three balls, one strike. All right, Chuck, this guy can run with anybody. A couple of times in spring training, he laid down a sacrifice bunt and beat them out. Mm. Well, he gave indication of bunt and pulled the bat out of the way, Joe, and now Sutcliffe has come right back. Three balls, two strikes. He was behind 3-0 and a moment ago. But Rick Sutcliffe trying to be the Jack Morris of the Orioles. You've got it. Swing a high fly ball, left center field, tracking it as Devereaux over in the alley in left center field. Mike reaches up, makes the catch, and for Sutcliffe and the Orioles, the Indians come three up and three down at the end of two and one half. The score, Cleveland nothing, the Orioles nothing. And here's Leo Gomez. He stands in and Nagy throws. Strike is called outside corner around the knees. The center fielder, Kenny Lofton, is very deep and toward the gap in right center field against the right-handed swings of Gomez. Albert Bell out in left field is way over in the alley toward left center field as if they figure that he is not going to be able to pull the ball the way Nagy intends to pitch. Here's a swing and a foul ball back to the screen, and the count is two strikes. Around that infield, Brooke Jacoby a third, Lewis a shortstop. Carlos Barriega is back on the outfield grass about one step as a second baseman. And Sorrento, the first baseman, playing a normal first base depth against a right-handed hitter. The pitch is outside for a ball. And we owe you a station break up and down the network. We'll try to get it for you at the earliest opportunity. One ball, two strikes. Bottom of the third of a scoreless ball game at Orioles Park at Camden Yards in Baltimore. Here's a swing and a miss. Good looking breaking ball from Charlie Nagy, and that'll be his first strike out of the afternoon, the first out of the inning, and as advertised, pausing now for station identification. This is the Orioles Radio Network. Well, Bill Ripken is going to be facing uh, the right-hander Nagy here in the bottom of the third inning, and uh, Cleveland's uh, starter throws fastball up and in, and Ripken took a cut, and Bill couldn't find it. Strike one. Right behind Billy will be Brady Anderson. He was the leadoff hitter in this auspicious, unforgettable debut of this park. Ball is high and tight to Bill Ripken. It's uh, kind, of a, uh, kind of an unusual feeling for me as I sit up here. I find my myself kind of looking around the ballpark picking up other things here's a swing ground ball hit toward the charging shortstop gloved hand pick up now the throw it's in the dirt but they get Bill Ripken on a pretty good play by first baseman Sorrento digging up what could have been an unfortunate throw but there's so much to see and uh, there's so many benefits and, and and goodies for the fans who pay their way to come to this ballpark and I remember the old trite expression there's not a bad seat in the house but I think that's almost 100% true in this ballpark. Even out on the outfield seats, you're so close to the action. A breaking ball too low to Brady for ball one. And right back, the left-hander takes a strike over the inside corner of the hands. Though Brady is a left-handed swinger, center fielder Lofton is playing toward the alley in left center field, and left fielder Albert Bell is very shallow. Down comes a pitch. Swing ground ball hit off the first base side. The second baseman gloved up side. Makes a pick up on the throw just in time to get Brady Anderson on a little bit of a number towards second base. Three up, three down. End of three. Orioles nothing. Cleveland nothing. Well, we're ready now to go to the uh, top of the fourth inning. And uh, designated hitter Glenn Allen Hill is due to lead off. He flied out to center field in the first inning. Uh, Carlos Baega will follow him. He skied to the right fielder in the first inning. And then Albert Bell, who is playing left field. He was originally scheduled to be the designated hitter, but he is uh, 
uh, playing in left field this afternoon. He was also scheduled to hit it. He fouled out to the first baseman first time up. SK Oriole Franks, the only Frank good enough to carry the Orioles' name and good enough to be served at Orioles Park at Camden Yards. SK tastes the difference quality makes. Right hand swinging, Glenn Allen Hill steps in and on the mound, the veteran Rick Sutcliffe. Sutcliffe into the move on the first offering. He missed a little bit outside. I'll tell you, when, when Sutcliffe misses, he is just missing slightly. Uh, he's very, very close to the strike zone with almost everything he throws. And uh, the Orioles play Hill just about straight away in all departments. Pitches just outside low, two balls and no strikes. So Chuck, uh, I, think our, I think our booth is about to become a presidential suite. I would be very happy to say. <laughs> Mr. President, sit down and uh, you can put the headset on maybe and hear what questions might be asked. And uh, first of all, before you do say anything, I want to tell you on behalf of WBAL how proud we are that you take the time to sit with us momentarily as a pop foul is going to be taken in by Oriole catcher Hoyles down the third base side to retire Glenn Allen Hill. Joe, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask the president, Joe, <laughs> Joe Angel, uh, I'd like to ask him your opinion of the ballpark, first of all, sir. Well, I, I think it is unbelievable. We had a chance to go below, which is uh, what you don't see is just as good as what you do see. It's a great ballpark. And marvelous facilities for the players. The rooms for changing, obviously, but then they get the workup rooms, the weight rooms, the, you know, all the health stuff. Just shape. like you had when you played. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I needed when I played. Uh, did you have a preference for, for the fastball? Were you a pretty good hitter or were you a better glove man? I was a better glove man, a fair hitter, only good. fair. Regrettably, it's been recorded on a top baseball card, so. Uh, uh oh. Oops, here we go. Well, I just don't seem to follow the top scorecards as well as I should. <laughs> it's a ball one to Carlos uh, Baega, who is uh, facing Sutcliffe for the second time. Uh, the Orioles' addition of Sutcliffe. You feel Sutcliffe. that's going to be a helpful move, don't you? Sutcliffe had a pretty good spring training, didn't yes, he? Yes, he did. And uh, he's a good kid, and he's uh, big. Yeah. I didn't realize how big that boy is. What, what is he, about 6'4"? About that. Yeah. Maybe, if he's also doing something he's never done before today. He's pitching against Cleveland. That's the only team in the major leagues he hasn't faced. And wait till he finds out you called him kid. 36-year-old <laughs> right. kid. He'll love you. He'll love you, he's Mr. Good. President. He you really got a will. vote. Hey, listen, everybody's a kid to me, man. <laughs> Here's a ground ball to the right side Ooh. of the second baseman, Billy Ripken. Pick up and throw, and he's got him. Two up, two down. Mr. President, tell us about the ceremonial first pitch. It looked like a breaking ball that was in the dirt. Well, that was, that seems to be. You had a very good, uh, very good view of it from up here, <laughs> and I was I was thought I was up against Ted Williams, coming in there from the port side, and so I wanted to keep it way on the outside and a little low. <laughs> What I mean is it just ran out of gas halfway there. That was the one pitch that Ted could not hit the breaking ball in the dirt. Like <laughs> yeah, that. That's right. He couldn't reach that one. But how about my grandson uh, throwing it over the middle you, right. of the plate? Didn't yeah. he though, huh? What was his feeling? He have anything to say about it to you? Did he make any comment at all? He was so overjoyed and, you know, kind of semi-scared to be here. He's playing a high school ball down in Florida. He's on 15. He's a sophomore. Good hitter. Mm -hmm. Bobby Brown was up with us at Camp David yesterday on a pitching machine helping the kid. And it got a good level swing and he throws it pretty good. Well he's playing probably the greatest game that anybody ever played. Uh, do you agree with that. Well I do and we had three generations of George Bush's our son George who's has the Rangers didn't yes, want sir. to go out he didn't want to he let his, his grandfather his, his dad get to take the what booze there might have been so he didn't want to go out there but <laughs> I just got a big thrill out of three a picture of three George Bush's in the game we all love it was wonderful. Well it's just a, it's just the best game that there ever was Mr. President we thank you very very much for your time and if you would be good enough to just sign that somewhere for me before you leave, and and Joe would also greatly appreciate that. Getting autographs. You got it. You got it. Stay well, sir. I came bringing uh, bringing something else too here. Oh, did you really? Yeah, you got it. Oh, I thank you very much, sir. Oh. Can't live without it. That and 70, all right, sir. That and seventy-five cents. You get a cup of coffee right in the stand. Stay well, Mr. President. Please do. Thank you, Mr. President. We have two down, and uh, Albert Bell with a count of two balls, two strikes. Sutcliffe just taking a bit of a breather. We'll see you. Again. Thank you again, sir. You know, the Orioles are 4-2 and two with Mr. Bush at the ballpark. That's Under true. Reagan, they never won a game with Reagan here, <laughs> and they never won a game with Jimmy Carter here. Now the 2-2 pitch on the way. Sutcliffe brings the arm down. He's a little bit high with the ball three. You know, you say a lot about our country, and it's got its faults just like any other country, but I guess the guy said, hey, is this, uh, you know, can you tell me any other country in the world where the leading figure would walk in and sit down in your radio booth and spend some time chatting with you about a ball game that he loves. Hey, that's a first for me. I loved it. Same with me. 
Hey, doctor, save me a tape, will you? I mean, I don't have very many souvenirs of this great game, but I have one this afternoon that yeah. I'll treasure forever. Two, three balls, two strikes now to Albert Bell. Nobody on. We're in the top of the fourth inning, a scoreless battle. A couple of right-handers, Sutcliffe for the Orioles and uh, Charlie Nagy for Cleveland. There's a ball four outside, and Sutcliffe just misses, but that will be his first free ticket, a two-out walk to Bell. Boy, I'll tell you, wait till you tell Sutcliffe that uh, the president called him a kid. He's going to love that, isn't he, though, Joe? Not only that, he called him a good-looking kid. Didn't he, though? <laughs> you know, the pitch to Albert Bell, a good, you know, a real good indication of how Sutcliffe approaches his job because he will never give in to a hitter. He will never give in to a hitter. He will challenge a hitter in his own way. Here's Sorrento, and he takes a ball one too high. I don't know uh, if you can answer this. Uh, I don't know how much, how many pitches uh, did did uh, Sutcliffe throw at, at any given time in spring training. How far did he go? Five innings, six innings? Well, he threw uh, uh, in one game 110 pitches, I believe. Well, that was the most he threw. Here's a swing and a high foul going to be out of play behind the plate, and the count is one ball and one strike. In fact, I think it was 105. The first 90 okay. were very effective, and he got tired and got shelled his last 15 pitches, but. Understandable in spring training when you get tired like that. Okay. Sorrento, the left-handed swinger, two out, runner leading first base, Albert Bell. They got a good hold with it over there. Sutcliffe's not paying a lot of attention to Bell. He's concentrating the 1-1 one -one offering to Sorrento, the left-handed hitter. The arm down on the pitch, breaking ball, strike is called. Beautiful looking pitch from Sutcliffe. And I'll tell you, he'll throw it no matter the count. He's got he's got confidence in his ability to throw everything in his repertoire and get a strike with it. And you know a lot of youngsters sitting in the Oriole dugout can look at this veteran right now and figure, hey, this fellow knows a little bit about the art of pitching. Strike three called outside corner at the knees of pitcher's pitch, and Larry Barnett rung up the strikeout. That's it. At the end of three and one half, it's still the Orioles nothing and the Indians nothing. Here is Orsalak, left-handed hitter, and he gets a ball one, to make it a strike one, excuse me. Larry Barnett, a solid American League umpire, umpire who is uh, my kind of an umpire because you don't have to wonder about where the ball is. He gives you a strike call, immediately it's thrown. This pitch is a little outside to make the ball, make the count, one ball, one strike. He also gets down on the knee as the pitch is thrown. It feels that it does help him get a little better Line on what's delivered. Swing and a foul ball right at the plate. It got a chunk of catcher Alomar. He seems to be okay. One ball, two strikes. Against the left-handed swings of Orth. Here comes Cal Ripken. Cal in his first at bat against Nagy uh, was out of the fly ball to left field. What a beautiful ballpark this is. What an absolutely magnificent looking place. And the pitch, it's a little bit low, ball one. Looking out over the right field area, the scoreboard down on the right field corner to the B&O warehouse. And that's a landmark. That's a setting that... You know, if you, if you look at a picture on the front of a golf scorecard, it shows you a hole, a 17th hole or something like that, that's significant. Signature hole. Oh, that's, yeah. That building is the signature for Oriole Park at Camden Yards. It's a magnificent-looking structure. That was a great decision to keep that where it surely was. Line drive down the left field side, curving. It's going to be a foul ball, and the count now is two balls, one strike. It was. You know, Chuck, it's only fitting that President Bush was here because Abraham Lincoln went through here. That's true. Three times. One time on his way to the Gettysburg Address. And a lot of people thought I was there to see him. But that's not true. <laughs> I was going to ask you about that. <laughs> I know you were. It's a swing and a, and a miss. The count is two balls, two strikes. How is Abe? <laughs> Last time I saw him, he was fine. <laughs> 
Center fielder uh, Lofton is Kenny is well over toward the gap in left center field. I mean, he's as deep as I think we're going to see a center fielder play. And that is the deepest part of the ballpark. You know, that's the amazing thing about this ballpark, Chuck. It's brand new, but it feels like it's been here forever. Swing of ground foul right at the plate. This got a chunk of uh, Cal. It really, you know, I've heard a lot of people say that. And incidentally, uh, uh, you know, I've, uh, the only information I've had about this ballpark and the things that have been going on prior to this afternoon was the information I read in the Baltimore Sun paper. And I must say that as a fan of, of Orioles baseball and an avid fan, avid fan of, the, of the paper, I think they did an absolutely tremendous job on the stories that, then, that they have written, the pictures they've taken of this uh, great-looking ballpark. Line drive down the left field side. Albert Bell can't get it. Face it. And Cal Ripken has the Orioles. Third hit of the afternoon. All have been singles. And the crowd that was kind of just, you know, uh, waiting, ex hoping something good could happen. Now suddenly, with one out, and Cal at first base are in the ball game again. You know, Chuck, it's interesting. The outfield grass also very lush. Yes, it is. Because when the ball landed, it was heading for the corner. Albert Bell had to go on the run to try to pick it off. And he ran. He actually had to slow down and reach back behind him to get the ball. So... Once the ball landed, it slowed down considerably. It's a very slow outfield once the ball lands. Here is uh, Glenn Davis. Davis uh, singled uh, through the middle of center field back in the second inning. Right-hander to right-hander. He looks at a ball high and outside. Kind of a hard breaking pitch. They are holding with Cal Ripken at first base. Sorrento's over there with a bag. Infield is up in double play depth. And for the first time today, the Oriole fans who are here by the thousands in this park that will hold 48,000 of them begin to pitch is just a little bit inside and Glenn kind of jumped back out of the way shrugged back I guess would be a better description here's another one of the Baltimore instances that is very successful Baltimore being the kind of a city it is populated by the kind of people that's one of the biggest reasons this man at the plate is back in a uniform this year swing and a foul ball in the dirt at the plate two balls one strike he was so impressed by what happened at Memorial Stadium last year the final three days of the season and all year long how people stayed with him and tried to help him wishing him to, that he could get over the very terrible injury that just ruined last season he felt that and that had a lot to do with his his de decision to sign early and try again with the Orioles in 92 and see if he couldn't in some way pay back but he said the people of Baltimore have not seen what I can do. That's right. I'm going to try and show him. He takes a strike over the inside corner of the hands. Two balls, two strikes. Good pitch from Charlie Nagy. So all of you who are Oriole fans tuned our way this afternoon. If you live in the Baltimore area, give yourself a little pat in the back. You had something to do with Glenn Davis signing again with the Orioles. And if you feel like saying it you can say it Baltimore is a very special baseball town ground ball glove side of the third base and he's got the second to one and on the first they get the double play around the horn five four three and that's it at the end of four innings of play in the first ever game at Oriole Park and Camden Yards the Cleveland Indians nothing the Baltimore Orioles nothing Joe Angel is ready and we're happy to bring him back all right Chuck thank you very much Mark Witten leads off of the Indians swings at the first offering and the uh, Fouls it back out of play. Nothing in one. Underway here. Witten, then Sandy Alomar, and then Brooke Jacoby. Bottom of the order for the Indians. Cleveland with no runs on one hit, and the Orioles with no runs on three hits. The Orioles have made the only error, but Mike Devereaux made a phenomenal play, saving a run early in the ballgame. Sutcliffe misses. A little bit low, I guess, and uh, the count even up at 1 1. Mark Witten became a strikeout victim his first time up. Sutcliffe with uh, three strikeouts thus far has walked only one man the veteran right hander delivers and Witten swings at a breaking ball grounds it to the second baseman Bill Ripken he gobbles it up and then throws him out so Witten is retired four to three he's 0 for two and now Sutcliffe will pitch to the young catcher Sandy Alomar. Sandy Alomar the Orioles are trying to do away with a recent trend and as far as the Orioles are concerned, it is a negative trend. The last four stadiums and their home openers, the home team has yet to win. 
Here's the pitch. There's a strike of the letters. Nothing. In fact, the last 10 new stadiums, their openers, the visiting team has won eight of those 10 openers. You know, one of the things that really impresses me today, the first inning passed and we were not trailing. There's a pitch inside, uh, jammed him, a swing and a foul back out of play behind the backstop. And the second inning passed and we were not trailing. The third inning passed and we're not trailing. Last year, 43 Three times, times. Mm. the Orioles. <laughs> that's become an infamous number. That's 43 it times. It really <laughs> yeah. The Orioles down by at least three runs before they came to bat in the fourth inning. Alomar stands in. Here's the two-strike delivery from Sutcliffe. He misses outside, wasting one. One ball and two strikes. Jacoby waits on deck. No score in the fifth. Alomar trying to stay healthy this year. Missed 111 games last year. Now the one-two pitch. Alomar swings and he lines it by the diving Gomez at third base. Into left field. Brady comes up with it. Gets it back into Cal. And one out single by Alomar. The ball was well hit. Gomez diving to his left. Trying to make a catch of the ball and could not make contact with it. So the Indians have their second hit. The other one uh, off the bat of Paul Sorrento back in the top of number two. Now with one away, here's Jacoby. Jacoby starting at third base uh, in this one because Jim Tomey, a youngster, is on the disabled list. He will be the regular third baseman when he gets back. Here's the pitch. Swung on and fouled back out of play. Nothing in one. Reggie Jefferson, another of the uh, very talented youngsters on this ball club is also on the DL and he will be the first baseman that's why Sorrento's in there today for Cleveland the Indians have talent in the starting lineup but their depth leaves a lot to be desired here's the 0-1 delivery swung on and driven to right center field Devereaux on the run heading for the gap Orsalak is there to his right in uh, right center field and Orsalak makes the catch the two outs. Now the young shortstop, Mark Lewis. That's the amazing thing about the Cleveland infield when Tommy gets back is the fact that Carlos Baerga, the second baseman, would then be the oldest of the infielders, and he's only 24 years old. Mark Lewis, he came up last year. This game is 0 for 1. He popped up. Sutcliffe ready and delivers. And Lewis takes a strike at the knees on the outside corner. Beautiful location. The count nothing and one. Lewis last year with 314 at bats had a batting average of 264. Had 15 doubles. And did not have a home run. He was not a power hitter at all. Here's a line drive, base hit left field. Racing in Brady to cut it off. He does. One hands it. Gets it back in toward third base. The Indians with a couple of hits. Runners on first and second and two outs. And now it'll bring up the top of the order. Center fielder, Kenny Lofton. There's Kenny Lofton, the Indian center fielder. In this game, he's 0 for 2. A couple of pop-ups. Lofton last year with Houston played in a total of 20 games. And barely hit 200. But this kid, a lot of talent. Can run. He is a tremendous bunter. I mean, he is really a good bunter. And steel bases. Great defensively. Line drive. Kind of a spray hitter. Here's the pitch. Lofton swings and he sends a fly ball. Left center field. Brady on the run. He will get there. He reaches up to make the catch. And the side is retired. No runs. A couple of hits. And the Indians leave two. Go to the bottom of the fifth. It's a nothing-nothing game. And here come the Orioles now. Bottom of the fifth inning. No score. Mike Devereaux will lead off. Then Sam Horn and then Leo Gomez against right-hander Charles Nagy, who has been every bit as tough as Rick Sutcliffe. Devereaux, 0 for 1, double play ball. Swings and sends a fly ball to medium deep center field. Lofton drifting to his right, and he makes the catch. Devereaux is done in by the other center fielder. Now... We'll take a look at Sam Horn again. Sam is one for one. He's single to left field. On the SK scoreboard, mentioned the Blue Jays in the win column already. They beat uh, Detroit 
by a score of 4-2. to two. And Jack Morris, who today made his 13th consecutive opening day start. That's a major league record. He went all the way for the Blue Jays, gave up two runs on five hits, and the Tigers did not score until the bottom of the ninth inning. Here's a pitch. Torn swings and fouls it back out of play behind the backstop. Nothing and one. And by the way, Dave Winfield, who had been bothered by a hamstring injury, did play and drove in the first run of 1992 with a base hit. Pat Borders had the year's first home run. John Olerud also hit one for the Blue Jays as Horn takes down and in. Even up at 1-1. And the big guy, Cecil Fielder, is off to a good start. He came up with his first home run. And Rob Deere also connected at Tiger Stadium. The ball was jumping. Pitch inside the horn. The count two and one. Jack Morris wins it. And Gullickson, who was a 20-game winner last year, he lost it for Detroit. Over 51,000 at Tiger Stadium. Horn takes a pitch in the dirt. With the count three and one. In the bottom of the seventh inning, Minnesota leads uh, Milwaukee two to one. In that game, Kirby Puckett with a home run game, came with a man aboard to give the Twins their two runs. Erickson against Wegman. There's a chopper foul. That ball came up and hit Sam on the face area, losing his batting helmet. Looks like he's okay though. Sam Horn retrieving his batting helmet, puts it back on. Well. Try and shake it off. Also in the American League, Texas will be at Seattle. Kansas City will be at Oakland. Apier will take on Dave Stewart. Stewart trying to come back from an offseason last year. In that Texas-Seattle game, Nolan Ryan pitching for the Rangers against uh, the tall man, Randy Johnson. Ryan said uh, a couple of days ago, this might be, more than likely, will be his last year. Pitch to Sam. He takes low and inside. Horn gets aboard. He has a single and a walk. And now we'll take a look at Leo Gomez. And for Nagy, that is the first walk he has issued. Gomez is 0 for 1. He grounded into a force out. In the National League, a final score. San Diego defeated Cincinnati 4 to 3. Jose Melendez, the winner. Jose Rijo, the loser. In the Jose game, Randy Myers getting a save for San Diego. Here's the pitch. And Gomez takes a little bit low off-speed pitch. One and oh. In that game, McGriff hit a home run. And Darren Jackson hit a home run for San Diego. The Giants nothing. The Dodgers now batting in the first. Here comes the pitch to Leo. He takes low again. Ball two. Two and oh. Montreal will be at Pittsburgh. And the Mets will be in St. Louis. David Cohn against Jose De Leon. That brings you up to date on the SK scoreboard. But a big day for the Blue Jays, a big day for Jack Morris, who, of course, did such a great job as he led the Twins all the way last year. Pitch to Leo, ground ball toward the hole. Base hit left field. Lewis diving, could not come up with it. Sam Horn stops at second. The ball coming into third. The Orioles... With a couple of men on base, only one away, and it'll bring up the catcher, Chris Hoyles. Chris Hoyles. So the right-hander getting behind uh, Leo Gomez, two balls and no strikes. He had to come in with a man at first base. Gomez was waiting for it, and he singles sharply into left field. Opening day, Oriole Park at Camden Yards. So far, it's been a pitcher's ball game, but... Here in the bottom of the fifth inning, the Orioles are making some noise. Runners on first and second with one out. Hoyles 0 for 1. He struck out. Chris Hoyles. He led the club in spring training home runs. He homered four times. He drove in 11 runs. The Indians with the infield double play depth. Jacoby, the veteran, backed up at third base. In center field, Lofton is shading Hoyles over toward right center. Medium depth. It comes a set by Nagy. The pitch on the way to Hoyles. In the dirt. Nicely saved by Alomar. And Alomar with men on base. Getting his body in front of it. The ball bounced in. And Alomar was able to make certain it stayed right there. One ball and no strikes. Now the right-hander Nagy again. Okay is a sign. Hoyles. 
Waves about a couple of times. Here comes the 1-0 delivery. Hoyle swings and he sends it to left center field. The ball heading for the open spaces. On the run is Lofton. He dives. He can't get it. It lands on the warning track and then bounces over the wall. And that will cost the Orioles a run. Because Gomez will be held at third base on the automatic double off the bat of Chris Hoyle. It's a rubber warning track in this ballpark. And that ball took a big bounce and went over the wall out there. Orioles ahead, one to nothing. Now with runners on second and third, here's Bill Ripken. Gomez is at third. Hoyles is at second base as he comes up with the first ever RBI at Camden Yards. Here's the pitch, a squeeze, it's bunted, it's a beauty, they've done it, Billy has done it. Jacoby will throw to first base in time to get the out. And on the suicide, the Orioles have taken a two to nothing lead. It'll go as a sacrifice for Bill Ripken, give him the RBI, and a two nothing Oriole lead. Johnny Oates tried that three times in spring training. And it was successful twice. So for the year, he's not gone three for four. One for one in regular season. And now the top of the order, Brady Anderson. Here comes the pitch. Brady takes a curve, a beauty. Call strike, nothing and one. In the inning, a walk to Horn, a single by Gomez, an RBI double by Hoyles, and the squeeze bunt. Off the bat of Bill Ripken. Here's the pitch. Brady takes a curve. Another beauty. Dropped in there for a call strike. With the count 0 and 2. Now if Brady can come up with a hit with two outs to drive in another run, this stadium will erupt. There is nothing as rejuvenating as a two out hit to drive in a run. Count nothing and two to Anderson. He's in a hole. Here comes the pitch fastball. He waved at it. Pitch out away from him. Not a very good at bat. The side retired. But the Orioles come up with a couple of runs on two hits. They leave a man. At the end of five, the Orioles a two to nothing lead. All right, the Orioles a two nothing lead. A lot of firsts at Oriole Park at Camden Yards. And John Patty had a talk with a, a fan who caught the very first foul ball in this new ballpark. We're in section 64 with Joel Meredith who caught the very first foul ball at Oriole Park. How did it happen, Joel? It, it just sort of bounced off the tarmac. The guy behind me tried catching it and bounced off his fingers and I just grabbed it with my right hand and tucked it under my body. Joel, one of the 48,000 plus having fun in the sun at Oriole Park at Camden Yards. I'm John Patty. Now back to you. All right. A souvenir that will never be forgotten. Here's Glenn Allen Hill leading off for the Indians in the sixth inning. He takes ball one. Next offering just off the outside corner. Ball two, two and oh. Glenn Allen Hill. He and Albert Bell will be sharing left field in 1992 for the Indians. This game is 0 for 2. He has popped out and fouled out. He swings and sends a fly ball to shallow right field. Orsalak is drifting over toward the foul line, still drifting, and reaches up and one hands it to get the out. That's going to be the tough sun field in this new ballpark. Orsalak staring straight into the sun. But able to make the play. One away, and now here's the switch hitting second baseman, Carlos Baerga. Baerga is 0 for 2. Suncliffe has given up only three hits in this game. The Indians have had only four base runners, three singles, and a base on balls. The Orioles ahead 2 0 in the sixth. Big gap in right center. Brad guy with that wide open stance. Sutcliffe delivers a fastball that misses outside. Ball one. Now the right-hander delivers again. By Edgar swings and he sends a fly ball out toward the right center. Orsalak and Devra had to make a long run. Orsalak is there. He's waiting, and he makes the catch. Baerga hit that just off the end of his bat. 
Oh, a couple of fly ball outs. And now here comes Albert Bell. Bell, this guy, a very strong, very dangerous right hand hitter. In here with two outs and the base is empty. Orioles ahead 2 0. Bell is 0 for, uh, 0 for 1. He was fouled out. And he has gotten a walk. Last year, Bell wound up with 28 home runs and drove in 95 runs in only 461 at bats. A couple of times he wasn't in the major leagues. Once he was suspended by baseball. The other time sent down by the Indians. Ground ball hit to third. Gomez to his left. Long throw. Davis comes off the bag, but he tags Bell as he ran by. So Bell is going on one pitch. Rick Sutcliffe in total command. Go to the bottom of number six. Orioles ahead two to nothing. Now the Orioles in the bottom of inning number six. The Orioles with a couple of runs on five hits. One error. The Indians no runs on three hits and no errors. Orsalak will lead off, then Cal, and then Glenn Davis against right hander Charles Nagy. Orsalak backs away momentarily. Joe starting in right field today is 0 for 2. A couple of times he is grounded to the first baseman Sorrento. Swings and he grounds it to the shortstop. Lewis, he comes up with it. On to Sorrento in plenty of time, and Orsalak is retired on one pitch. Now here's Cal. Visit your Rite Aid Pharmacy today for low everyday prices on thousands of quality health and beauty care products. This week, find Hershey's Pastel Kisses. Feature priced at only $2.19. The savings, the selection, and the service are all close by at your neighborhood Rite Aid. Save up to 70% over many national brands with Rite Aid brand products. And save on hundreds of brand name items with the right buys. Where manufacturers' price reductions are passed along to you every day. There's a pitch to Cal. Is a breaking ball for a call strike. There's a right aid near you. Cal Ripken, one for two. Single, and he has popped up. He takes low and outside. Ball one. One and one with Glenn Davis waiting on deck. Here's a pitch. Cal takes a little bit low. Throw it two and one. Nobody warming up in the Cleveland bullpen on opening day. And earlier, when the Orioles came up with a couple of runs in the fifth, they had Rod Nichols, a right-hander, and Eric Bell, a left-hander, and the former Oriole warming up in the bullpen, but no longer. Here's the pitch. Cal swings, and he pulls it foul. Just couldn't wait long enough. The count to Cal now even up at two and two. Cal with a couple of home runs in spring training. And, of course, uh, trying to get off to a good start. Trying to follow up on last year. You have to wonder what could Cal do for an encore. What an amazing season. But Glenn Davis is healthy. There's a little bouncing ball up the middle. Lewis behind second base has it. On to Sorrento in time. And Cal is retired 6-3. to three. Now we'll take a look at Glenn Davis. Glenn Davis. Glenn Davis, last year only 176 at-bats, but with 10 home runs and 28 RBIs. So, over a full season, Davis would have hit over 30 home runs and would have knocked in over 100 runs based on those figures. He's had a good spring, hit over 300 with a couple of home runs and seven RBIs. Takes a curve a little bit high and inside, ball one. Glenn Davis, this game a single and a double play ball. Two to nothing Orioles in the bottom of the sixth on opening day. Charles Nagy, stocky right-hander, delivers. And he missed inside, maybe a bit low. Two and O. Oh. If you look at Glenn Davis's numbers over his career, he's averaged about a home run every 18 at-bats. And remember, he played his home games in Houston. Very tough to hit home runs there. Pitch a little bit too high. Ball three, three and zero. Oh. Ooh, here it comes! But before Nagy delivered the pitch, Davis had called time. Joe, we opened up the we the Orioles opened up that ballpark in Houston. 
and I have very fond memories of it. They gave us a great tour of the ballpark. The Yankees were playing. We played them the next uh, that after, that evening. Walked through all those boxes, and I found a baseball fan sitting up there in his sofa, television turned on, watching Lassie. <laughs> well, chopper foul at that third baseline. <laughs> never, never forgot that. I mean, here's one of the great edifices in the country, and it's built to you know, uh-huh. house a baseball team. And this gentleman's up there, the heck with the Yankees in Houston. He's watching Lassie. <laughs> well, good for him. Glenn Davis, no doubt, very happy that he doesn't play half his games in that ballpark anymore. Here's a 3 1 that every oh. swung and he lifted it uh, out toward right center field. Mark Whitten to his right, got the shades down. Now Lofton is there, and Lofton makes the catch. At the last moment, Whitten gave way to Lofton, and Lofton forgot how many outs there were. That was number three. The Orioles go down in order, and at the end of six, it is two to nothing Orioles. I have the totals on the board. Uh, the Orioles with a couple of runs on five hits and the Indians with no runs on three hits. Rick Sutcliffe has been in command, but just in case, Storm Davis begins to warm up in the Oriole bullpen. We go to number seven and back with the play by play. Let's get right back to Chuck Thompson. Thanks a lot, Joe. Here is uh, the left hand swinging Paul Sorrento was singled and looked at the third strike. Ground ball base hit right through the middle into center field. He picked on Sutcliffe's very first pitch and drilled it to the right side of the second baseman on into center field. That's his second hit of the afternoon, two for three. There is bullpen activity. Eric Bell, a left-hander, is up and throwing for the Tribe. And for the Orioles, uh, Storm Davis has just begun to loosen up as we head and are in the top of the seventh inning with the Orioles leading two to nothing. Now, here's Mark Whitten. He struck out and grounded a second in two previous turns. He is a switch hitter and a left-hander against Sutcliffe. Sorrento with a just kind of a shallow lead at first. Sutcliffe throws. He's low inside on the ball one. Sutcliffe so far this afternoon has given up only one walk, one free ticket. And he's had runners on in the second inning, in the fourth inning, and again in the fifth inning, and so far has not given up a run. The big Oriole right-hander breaking ball is low inside, and they appeal, and the umpire at third base, Greg Cox, says no, he did not commit himself. So the count is two balls and no strikes. What a glorious afternoon. Everything just seemed to go well for the Orioles and uh, and the state of Maryland who, you know, had pitch coming 2 nothing Swing ground ball at the first baseman. He's got it. The throw goes to second. That's one. Now back to first base. Yes, sir. The 3-6-3. Three, Glenn Davis made a heck of a good grab on the infield grass and made a perfect throw to second base and then back to first for the 3-6-3 double play. And just like that, Sutcliffe made the kind of a pitch that enabled his infield to get him out of a a jam. But, you know, everybody is so proud of this new ballpark, and it's just kind of fitting. And I think if you have a chance to come and see it, you will enjoy it too. It's just kind of fitting that we got a very good day weather-wise, and we've had a darn good ball game to follow it. And the opening game ceremonies uh, took a little while, but uh, everybody was in such a good frame of mind, I I don't think that they minded. Now here's Sandy Alomar. He's a right-handed swinger. One hit and two trips, swinging a high pop down the first base side. Glenn Davis coming over near the box seat railings, but it'll be in among the spectators and out of play. All of the seats, even those of you who are sitting out in left field in the upper tier, there are three tiers, and if, if you're sitting in the second or third tier, you're still right on top of the ballpark. You've got great sight lines. It's and the seats are bigger and more comfortable. For many years, I've said, you know, to, when I was in Boston doing games out of Fenway, uh, uh, the Orioles played. I'd say, gee, if you ever spend vacation time up in Boston, for goodness sakes, come see a ball game at Fenway Park. Well, I can now tell people about seeing a ball game at this one. Here's a breaking pitch high, one ball and one strike. It really is a classic structure, and all of us who are citizens of this great old state of Maryland can be very, very proud of it. It is something that people will talk about and come to see for years and years in the future. One ball, one strike. Sutcliffe throws. Fastball is in right at the knees. Strike two called. What a pleasure it is to sit up here and watch that man work. I've heard about Rick. I saw him years ago when he pitched a little bit with Cleveland, but, you know, recently he's been in the other league and then he had injuries and shoulder problems. 
And it, what a great pleasure it is to see this man working in an Oriole uniform. Breaking stuff just missed outside. Two balls, two strikes. Bullpens are active. Storm Davis for the Orioles. And they have Nichols, uh, Rod Nichols, up along with Eric Bell out on the Cleveland bullpen. Orioles 2, Cleveland nothing. This is the top of the seventh inning with two out and nobody on. And the 2-2 pitch on the way to Alomar. Swing and a fly ball toward the gap right center field. Devereaux seems to have it tracked, and the center fielder is there to make the catch for the final out of the inning. At the end of six and a half, the Orioles two and the Indians nothing. In the Orioles half of the seventh inning, and everybody is standing, stretching, and enjoying the sights as Devereaux steps in and gets a strike called from Larry Barnett. In the bottom half of the seventh inning, Devereaux this afternoon has hit into a double play. And first ball hitting back on the fifth inning sky to center field. Swing and a fly ball. Well hit. Center field way. Coming up on the ball now is Loft in the center fielder. And he makes the catch without any difficulty. So Devereaux is a quick out. One down. And here comes Sam Horn, the Orioles' designated hitter. And before he steps in, we step out for a station break. This is the Baltimore Orioles Baseball Sam Network. Horn. First pitch to Sam Horn, the great big strong looking left-handed batter is outside low. The starters are still with us. Charles Nagy has gone all the way so far into the bottom of the seventh for the Tribe. And the bullpens have just been activated here in this seventh inning. Nagy throws ground ball right off the pitcher's glove on through into center field for another, another base hit for Sam Horn. I'm not too sure whether touching the ball may have put it out of reach of the second baseman by Erga or not, but he never did get near it. So it's a single for Sam. That's his second hit this afternoon, and the batter now will be the right-handed batting Leo Gomez. Four, four, five, six, eight is the attendance this afternoon. That means that 4,000 didn't show. Is that right? Here comes Gomez, who takes a ball over the outside corner, and a strike is called. Leo hit into a forced play in the second inning, and then he was right in the middle of the Orioles' two-run uprising in the bottom of the fifth with a solid base hit, and eventually scored the Orioles' second run. The pitch, low and away, one ball, one strike. Chris Hoyle's double which was a ground rule variety, could have scored two runs, but he had to be satisfied with one ribby in that it hit on the warning track and bounced over the fence. The pitch, swinging a ground ball sharply, hit up the third baseman. He's made a grifty play, nifty play, throw to second for one, and on to first for the double play. Long way around the horn, 5-4-3. And Gomez just hit the ball so sharply, uh, Jacoby had little or no trouble turning it into a twin killing. At the end of seven, Orioles two, Indians nothing. What a nifty ball game for an opener here in Baltimore. Orioles Park at Camden Yards. A smashing success this afternoon. Joe's got some attendance figures for us. He's also got some more baseball. Joe? All right, very good. And uh, Mike Hargrove, the Cleveland manager, is going to his bench here in the eighth inning. Alex Cole will come up to hit for the veteran. Brooke Jacoby was 0 for 2 while he was in there. Cole, a speedster who had been the regular center fielder but lost the job to Kenny Lofton this year. And Cole... Takes a strike called from Rick Sutcliffe. Sutcliffe going into the eighth inning here. He has given up four hits. The Indians have had only five base runners. Here's the pitch. It's a little bit low to Cole. It is even up at one and one. Rick Sutcliffe into the eighth inning here on opening day. We had mentioned earlier he's had now this being his eighth opening day start and on only one occasion had he gone all the way in the opener. Misses a little bit high to Cole. Well, the count is two and one. That was when he opened for the Indians back in April of 1984 when he went nine innings in winning over Texas. There's a 2-1 delivery. Cole takes a little bit too high. Not a good idea to walk this guy. The count three and one. He is quite a base dealer. 
but uh, he didn't get he didn't do anywhere near what Cleveland wanted him to do last year. They tried to build her up. Here's a three one to Derby. There's a strike off the outside corner. Barely so. Tried to build her offense around him and he uh, he was nine for twenty one in his first efforts to steal. Here's a pitch. Cole takes a call strike three at the knee. It looked like Cole was just going to stand there hoping to get a walk. He never got the bat off his shoulders. It looked like a pretty good pitch. So Sutcliffe gets a strike out and with one away it'll bring up the shortstop Mark Lewis. Sutcliffe into the eighth inning has now thrown uh, what 90 pitches and 50 of them have been strikes. Here's the pitch to Lewis takes a strike right down the middle. Storm Davis and Mike Flanagan right hander and a left hander warming up in the Oriole bullpen. Mark Lewis in the game is one for two. He has popped out and he is single. Lewis one of the many youngsters on this Cleveland ball club. Sutcliffe will deliver to him and Lewis takes a fastball just off the outside edge. It was even up at one and one. The Orioles got a couple of runs in the fifth. An RBI double by Hoyles. And then a suicide squeeze. Executed beautifully by Bill Ripken. Here's the pitch. Lewis swings and he lofts it foul off to the right. That'll become a souvenir on opening day at this new ballpark. One and two to the Cleveland shortstop. Lewis last year in 314 at bats. At a batting average of 264 for the Indians, joined the club in late April. Here's the pitch. There's a strike called beauty at the knees on the outside corner, and Rick Sutcliffe with a couple of strikeouts, both looking. That gives him five in the game, and now with two outs, top of the order, and Kenny Lofton. Lofton is 0 for 3. He's at three fly balls. A guy like Lofton is much like Brady Anderson. Really, he can't afford to get the ball airborne. He's got to hit the ball on the ground, try to bunt it behind the mound. It drops. Going to have to hustle. Billy barehands it, but he has no play. I mean, Lofton is as fast as anyone in the game. And uh, trying to bunt his way aboard. He got under it. And he hit it over the mound. The ball landed behind the mound. By the time Billy came up with it, he had no play. So Lofton gets aboard, and now Sutcliffe will go to work on Glen Allen Hill. We mentioned earlier a couple of times in spring training, Lofton, trying to lay down a sacrifice bunt, was able to beat the throw at first base, even though he was sacrificing. So that gives you a good idea of his speed. Now it'll be right-hander against right-hander. Sutcliffe against Glenn Allen Hill. This guy's got home run power. The infield backed up. The outfield about medium depth. The Brady a little bit on the deep side in left field. Devro shading Hill over toward left center. Glenn Allen Hill. He's 0 for 3. He steps in. Sutcliffe. Okay is a sign at the belt. Turn to lob the ball to first. And Lofton is able to get back. The Orioles ahead 2 nothing. Lofton with tremendous speed on the bag at first. On deck is Carlos Baerga. Go to first again. Uh, Sutcliffe, not his good move. And Lofton back in easily. The Indians have used Cole. He is the only left-handed bat on the bench. Rody is a switch hitter. They also have Felix Fermin, Junior Ortiz. He was with the Twins a year ago. And Tony Perez Chica is also available. So the Indians don't have a scary bench. Here it comes. Fastball. Strike called at the letters on the outside corner. Nothing in one the count. I think the Indians are going to have to live and die with their regulars. They don't have any power on the bench. Sutcliffe ready and delivers again. Swing and a miss at a good breaking ball of it almost in the dirt. Bell chased it and goes right through it. Nothing in two. Rick Sutcliffe 
He's a battler. He has struck out two in the inning. And he has a nothing and two count on Glenn Allen Hill. He's ready. And here it comes. Swing and a comebacker. Sutcliffe spears it. And he throws him out. Sutcliffe getting a standing ovation as he walks off the mound. No runs to hit. They lead one. Go to the bottom of the eighth inning. Orioles ahead two to nothing. All right now the Orioles in the bottom of the eighth inning. Charles Nagy, the right-hander for the Indians, still in the ballgame. They do have a new third baseman. Tony Perez Chica has replaced Brooke Jacoby at third base. And Alex Cole has stayed in the game in center field. Nagy will go to work on uh, the catcher. Chris Hoyles. Then Bill Ripken. And then the top of the order, Brady Anderson. And Hoyles takes a little bit low. Ball one. Both Nagy and Sutcliffe have been very tough. The Orioles came up with a couple of runs in the bottom of the fifth, and that's been it. They lead two to nothing. Rick Sutcliffe is around 100 pitches now as uh, Nagy misses a little bit outside. Well, the count to Hoyles is two balls and no strikes. Greg Olson is warming up in the Oriole bullpen. Sutcliffe, we mentioned earlier in spring training, did have one game in which he threw about 105 pitches. There's a swing and a fly ball out to shallow right field. And Mark Witten tapping his mitt, staring up, waiting, and he makes the catch. One gone. Now the second baseman, Bill Ripken. Billy, who had a terrible spring offensively, but again, did a great job defensively. Offensively, hit only 120 in the springtime. But in this game, he came up with a couple of men on base, runners on second and third, in the bottom of the fifth, after the Orioles had taken a one nothing lead, Johnny Oates called for the suicide, and Billy did a whale of a job executing. Takes a breaking ball low and outside. One and oh. He got a very tough pitch to bunt, but somehow he made contact, was able to get the ball down, and the suicide worked to perfection. There's a swing, and he pulled it foul. Even up at 1-1. And that's awfully tough to do. You know the runner at third bearing down on you. The pitch looked like it was high and inside. He had to make a lunging attempt at the ball. Somehow he had to make contact and put the ball in play. Here's the pitch. This one just a little bit low and outside. Two and one to Bill Ripken. The Orioles ahead 2 nothing. Bottom of the eighth inning. Opening day 1992. So far the day has been perfect. There's a swing and a pop up behind the plate. Alomar throws away the mask and he makes the catch. Almost directly behind home plate. Though with two gone, now the top of the order, Brady Anderson will come up to hit. Brady has yet to get aboard. He's 0 for 3. A couple of ground outs Brady and a strikeout. Anderson. Charles Nagy, last year a rookie, a 10 game winner, but also a 15 game loser. But he has good control, has good stuff, has good location, keeps the ball down, and rarely gives up a home run. Low chopper, right of the mound, Nagy running over the field. He will flip the ball to first base in time to get the out, and the side is retired. For the Indians, it'll be Baerga, Bell, and Sorrento coming up to hit. We head to the ninth. The Orioles ahead two to nothing. What a day this has been. Sellout crowd, beautiful weather, and historic occasion. Rick Sutcliffe, the veteran right-hander, trying to show the way for the Orioles. Jack Morris today went all the way for the Blue Jays in his Toronto debut. And Rick Sutcliffe trying to do likewise for the Orioles. In the ninth inning, the Orioles a two to nothing lead. Carlos Baerga will lead off for Cleveland. Then Albert Bell, and then Sorrento will come up to hit. Here comes the pitch. Baerga takes a strike called again. Sutcliffe is able to get ahead. Baerga is 0 for three, switch hitter, but he is much more effective against left-hand pitchers. Against lefties, he hit almost 330 last year. Against right-handers, he hit 273. Sutcliffe delivers a fastball a little bit too high even up at 1 1 by Edgar who played at third base 
Played at second base. This year will be the full time second baseman. Here's a 1 1 delivery. Bayed got a check swing. It'll cost him. Rising fastball, and Bayed got couldn't hold up in time. One ball and two strikes to count. Because Bayed got one of the people coming to Cleveland in the Joe Carter deal. Rick Sutcliffe. What a performance so far. Here comes a 1 2 delivery. A line drive off of Sutcliffe. Cal has it behind second base. He swings at the first in time to get the out. That ball hit Sutcliffe. And the ball slowed down. Cal able to get to it behind second base. On a ball deflected by Sutcliffe. Nicely done by the Orioles. Sutcliffe is okay. Now with one away, he's only two outs away. He'll go to work on right hand hitting Albert Bell. Albert Bell in the game is 0 for 2 with a base on balls. Sutcliffe ready and delivers Bell. Check swing. He laid off and the pitch a little bit outside. Ball one. The Orioles ahead 2 0, ninth inning. It has been awfully difficult for the home team to win in these kinds of openings. Brand new stadiums. They are 0 for the last four and only two for the last ten. But the Orioles only two outs away. There's a swing and a fly ball very high. Shallow left center field. Billy goes out there in shallow center. He one hands it to get the out. And now Sutcliffe is only one out away. <laughs> Now here's Sorrento and the crowd at Oriole Park at Camden Yards on its feet. Sutcliffe is only one out away. And what a storybook start this would be for Rick Sutcliffe, the veteran right-hander, 36 years of age, to come up with a complete game on opening day at their new home. Here's the pitch. Very high ball one. Just in case, Greg Olson warming up in the Oriole bullpen. The Orioles ahead two to nothing. Sorrento with a couple of hits. He's had two of the five Cleveland hits. The windup and the pitch. Sorrento swings and he fouls it back out of play. Even up at one and one. Sorrento picked up a few days ago from the Minnesota Twins. And just a couple of hours after the Twins traded Sorrento, Kent Herbeck came up injured. It's something the Twins, I'm sure, feel they uh, wish they hadn't done. Herbeck is on the DL. Here's a windup and a 1 1 pitch on the way to Sorrento. Check swing on the breaking ball. He went too far. It's a strike. One and two is the count. Sutcliffe, one out away. He's one strike away. Hands on their feet. Mark Whitten waiting in the on deck circle. Sutcliffe peers in, says yes, into his motion. Here comes the pitch. Sorrento takes a full strike three, and the Orioles are in the win column on opening day. Greg Sutcliffe being congratulated by his teammates. As they form a victory line in the infield, Sutcliffe, what a performance. What a performance. Goes all the way. He gives up only five hits. He walked only one. He wound up with a total of six strikeouts, including three in the final two innings. And so this one is history. Oriole Park at Camden Yards has been inaugurated, and the Orioles come up with a two to nothing shutout, back with the totals. Right after this. Ladies and gentlemen, we hope you have enjoyed this historic day at our park.